everyone. I'm uh, Jeff Gordon, and I'm here to welcome you on behalf of my colleagues at uh, Columbia for our um, participation in this rather remarkable event, which is an effort to uh, unite the world in collective thinking about uh, the challenges that um, the COVID-19 uh, pan pandemic has brought to uh, the governance, the FinReg policy, and other policy issues that many of us have spent our professional lives trying to, to deal with. And now we find that challenge in a context that's quite different. Um, so we're sort of near the end of the 24 hours, so I hope all the technological issues have been involved. Those who are now joining know from your prior experience uh, that you are free to exit, to leave the meeting, and using the same link to come back to the meeting. Um, if you have a question, uh, then there's a Q&A function. We'll try to get to them, although I think um, uh, given, given the many Columbia speakers, it'll be, um, uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not predicting that there'll be a lot of time at uh, the very end. So uh, this is gonna be recorded for use um, on the Columbia website, perhaps other venues. I wanna thank everyone here, my, my colleagues, but also uh, the, broader, the broader audience from, from their for, for their participation today. I know that <clears throat> we would all uh, be curious to hear your reactions. If uh, the Q&A is too limited a forum, then the emails of all of us are available through uh, the website. And so this may mark the beginning of a discussion rather than the end. So to be brief, I just want to discuss the, uh, the, the three buckets in which uh, uh, the colleagues will speak. First of all, <clears throat> the government responses to the pandemic. Um, secondly, the private responses to the pandemic. And then thirdly, the enduring issues uh, seen through the pandemic lens. The government responses are going to be uh, provided by Lev Menand um, and Kate Judge, who will speak in different ways about the role of the Fed. Jack Coffey, who will describe uh, the CARES Act and um, some of the, the Wall Street goodies from it. Todd Baker, uh, the small business aspects from it, which is highly relevant, of course. Uh, um, Eric Talley is going to speak about <clears throat> the way that uh, MAC clauses have played a significant role in upending or not upending M&A, and maybe what we can see in the future as to how those clauses are, are redone. And then finally, <clears throat> uh, some of the ongoing issues through the pandemic lens, Katerina Piss, 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 or Josh Mitz, and me will we'll, um, take our different approaches. So with that, um, let me turn it over to Lev Menand, um, who will begin our discussion of the Federal Reserve. I'm stopping my share, Lev, and it's all up to you. Thank you, Jeff. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. So when it comes to responding to the outbreak here in the US, the Fed has emerged as one of the most active institutions at the federal level. I'm going to focus my remarks on what it's doing and how its actions line up with its enabling statute. In my view, there's a bit of a mismatch. And in the medium term, I think Congress ought to address this mismatch. And I'll conclude with a few words about why. Then I'll turn things over to Kate, who will talk about how mission overload might affect the Fed going forward. So what is the Fed doing? In the last month, the Fed has launched 13 different emergency loan initiatives. Eight of these are designed to stop a run in the money markets by making very short-term loans to financial firms. I've labeled these liquidity facilities. 
The other five extend credit to non-financial businesses and are designed to prevent a wave of business bankruptcies. And I've labeled these credit facilities. Through the liquidity facilities, the Fed is exchanging cash for a relatively low risk financial assets. These facilities are like a discount window for non-bank financial firms, securities dealers, money market mutual funds, finance companies, and foreign banks. Firms that fund themselves like banks, but do not have access to the Fed's standing liquidity facility. A bit of background on this facility. Congress created the discount window so that the Fed could backstop banks. The way it works is that banks have accounts with the Fed, and when those accounts run low, the Fed lends them money against certain collateral by increasing their account balances. These balances are called reserves. And in addition to borrowing reserves from the Fed, banks can also borrow reserves from each other in what's known as the federal funds or Fed funds market. The inability of non-banks to borrow at the discount window or in the Fed funds market was meant to be a feature of our system, not a bug. Um, so Congress designed the Fed as a banker's bank to function as a bank for banks. The theory being that in a credit crunch, the Fed would support banks and the banking system would continue to lend to everyone else, including other financial firms. But the theory um, assumed that only banks would engage in banking, issuing demandable debt obligations like deposits that augment the supply of physical currency. The system was not designed to accommodate non-banks issuing similar obligations. Um, and yet practice moved away from theory. And by 2007, a parallel shadow banking system had grown so large that it dwarfed the banking system. And when the economy slowed and asset prices fell, banks were either unable or unwilling to backstop shadow banks. So the Fed was forced to stretch its statutory powers to save the system from collapse. Why? Because at that point, such a large fraction of economic activity um, it depended on credit provided by shadow banks. Were the shadow banks to fail, price signals would go haywire and the economy would grind to a halt. Unfortunately, in the aftermath, Congress didn't restructure the financial system, nor did it redesign the Fed. It actually rolled back some of the Fed's powers. So when asset prices fell earlier this year, shadow banks needed help, and the Fed was forced again to improvise. It reopened five 2008 era programs designed to backstop different types of shadow banks. It also began lending dollars to foreign central banks through swap lines and a new program called FEMA. These programs are designed to on lend dollars to financial institutions overseas. Um, and these institutions need dollars because they issue dollar denominated deposits and other short term dollar debt. Uh, so the Fed is underwriting each of these facilities itself, with the Treasury investing $10 billion of equity in three of them. Uh, and mostly the Fed is working through known counterparties, the primary dealers. But for the CPFF, which will buy commercial paper directly from non-banks, the Fed has hired PIMCO and State Street to help it out. And it's worth briefly um, dwelling on the swap lines and FEMA. So swap lines are risky because there's no real collateral all the Fed gets is an account balance in a foreign currency on the books of a foreign central bank. In the event of default, there's little recourse. FEMA, by contrast, is much safer because the Fed takes US Treasury securities as collateral. Uh, so the bottom line is all eight of these programs extend the central bank's classic lender of last resort function to shadow banks. They involve creating new reserves to backstop private sector money augmentation, and done properly, a relatively small amount of new reserves can prop up giant markets because to be a bit reductive about it, once the Fed announces it will backstop a promise to pay dollars, it makes that promise as good as dollars and the run stops. Um, the Fed's new credit facilities are really a whole different animal. Let's see if I can get that slide. Um, these programs lend money to non-financial businesses and municipalities, either through the banking system, through the bond market or directly. Um, whereas liquidity programs backstop money markets, meaning they stabilize the value of deposits and deposit substitutes, ensuring that these private monies trade at par with actual dollars, the Fed's credit facilities really have nothing to do with money markets. These facilities are not designed to preserve existing credit arrangements by preventing fire sales. They're designed to expand credit. Um, accordingly, these facilities raise all sorts of questions about underwriting and credit risk. 
And so here's what we know so far. The Fed is setting the general eligibility policies for each facility for the PMCCF and the SMCCF, which are designed to lend money directly to big businesses. The Fed has hired BlackRock to help it apply these policies and Treasury will put up equity to absorb losses. For the PP PLF, MSNLF and MSELF, which are designed to lend to small and medium-sized enterprises. The Fed has deputized banks to do the underwriting and servicing. For the PPP loans, the Fed will bear no risk of loss. For the Main Street loans, the banks will have skin in the game and the Treasury will put up 75 billion. So the Fed is going to help state and local governments also with the MLF by lending up to 500 billion, but it's not yet provided details on how it's gonna do this exactly. What we do know is the Treasury will contribute 35 billion in loss protection. So all told, the liquidity facilities have enlarged the Fed's balance sheet by around $680 billion. And if all goes well, these programs won't get any larger and indeed they'll start to shrink. Uh, by contrast, the credit facilities are expected to expand the balance sheet by $2 trillion. And um, this number could easily grow in the coming months. So what are the legal foundations for this unprecedented balance sheet expansion? Um, the Fed is relying primarily on two provisions of its enabling act, section 13.3 and section 14. So here is section 13.3. See if I can pull that up. Um, and let's start with the biggest hiccup first. It has to do with the treasury department. So 13.3 as amended in 2010 requires the Fed to ensure that taxpayers are protected from losses. For the CPFF, and you can see that here, hold on. And for the CPFF, the MFFLF and TALF, the Treasury provides the necessary protection using money from the Exchange Stabilization Fund, which is an account of around 100 billion. Um, and the ESF is designed to allow the secretary to stabilize the value of the dollar against foreign currencies and to assist the U.S. in meeting its commitments to the IMF. And that law provides that uh, consistent with an orderly system of exchange rates, the secretary may deal in gold, foreign exchange, and other instruments of credit and securities. In 2008, Treasury used this authority to backstop money market funds and Congress wasn't pleased and it passed a law explicitly prohibiting the practice and you can see that right here. Um, although Congress seems much more willing to look the other way this time, it's hard to see how Treasury's use of the ESF is any more legal. Treasury's investment in these Fed facilities is not related to maintaining an orderly system of exchange rates, the statutory predicate upon which the secretary is authorized to deal in securities, nor is it clear that the secretary's investment can be construed as dealing in securities, being that it's at best the purchase of a bespoke equity instrument that's not traded on secondary markets. Um, another wrinkle involves the part of 13.3b1, which requires the board to establish policies to permit lending only for the purpose of providing liquidity to the financial system. This text was also added uh, by Dodd-Frank in 2010. Um, under the original design of 13.3, in an emergency, the Fed could underwrite loans directly to individuals, partnerships, and corporations, which it did in the 1930s. And Dodd-Frank repealed this authority and replaced it with something rather different, the power to create facilities to provide liquidity to non-bank financial firms. In other words, in 2010, Congress sort of chucked the part of 13.3 that, that authorized the Fed to lend to the real economy. Um, the 5133 liquidity facilities are the sorts of programs the new law permits. Uh, but the five credit facilities established more recently do not really have much to do with providing liquidity to the financial system. They're designed to lend to the real economy. Um, so luckily for the Fed, Congress came to the rescue on March 27th uh, because the CARES Act in a sort of incredible legislative sleight of hand amends section 13.3 sub silentio. Uh, so how does it do this? Uh, well, it appropriates $454 billion and it instructs the treasury secretary to invest the money in Fed facilities that lend directly to the real economy. If the Fed could not create such facilities, if it could only provide liquidity to the financial system, then this appropriation would be a sort of a dead letter. 
And to make the point clear, the CARES Act actually quotes the ostensibly restrictive language from 13.3 about the Fed's facilities being for the purpose of providing liquidity to the financial system and uses it to describe what the relevant real economy lending programs would do. Uh, so Congress basically defines this text down to nothing. Um, so, so far, all the Fed's actions sort of seem kosher, at least read in light of the CARES Act. Um, I think a bit dicey are, are the Fed's swap lines, repo operations, and FEMA facility. So section 14, bring that up. Section 14 authorizes the Fed to buy and sell various types of assets. Um, but the Fed is using this authority to lend. So let's start with the swap lines. In a swap, the Fed increases on its books the account balance of a foreign central bank. Um, and in exchange, the foreign central bank increases the Fed's balance on its books, denominated in whatever currency it issues. Um, the arrangement is structured as a purchase of foreign currency, but it's, it's really a loan. Sometime in the future, the purchase will be unwound and both balance sheets will shrink back down. Um, except one thing will have changed. The foreign central bank will have surrendered more dollars from its account than the Fed added to it to begin with, and that amount is interest. Uh, the Fed has been doing this since the 1960s. Um, in 1961, the Fed's general counsel wrote an internal memo blessing the practice, um, although he acknowledged that there could be criticism, quote, on legal grounds. His argument was that Section 14 allows the Fed to purchase and sell cable transfers, which are foreign currency instruments, and to maintain accounts with foreign central banks. Um, but he ignores the words in the open market. Um, the swap lines are not purchases and sales of foreign currency in the open market. They're bilateral deals at non-market prices. They're loans. Um, and this problem is even starker when you consider the Fed's repurchase operations with dealer firms and the FEMA facility. Um, through these programs, the Fed lends cash against US debt obligations structuring the loans as sale and repurchase agreements. So in the first leg, the Fed buys the debt security. And in the second leg, the Fed sells it back. Uh, but neither leg transacts at a market price. The Fed buys the security for considerably less than it's worth. Uh, this is the haircut. Um, then the Fed sells it back for more than it paid for it. And this is the interest payment. Um, and the Fed claims these facilities are authorized by the provision of Section 14 that permits buying and selling securities. Um, bring that up. Um, but again, it totally ignores the language requiring to, it to do this in the open market. These transactions are not at market prices. Uh, indeed, the Fed sale of securities is not really a sale at all. It's a settlement of a forward transaction. So think about it this way, you know, if this were kosher, what would be the point of any of the lending restrictions in Section 13? The Fed could lend to anyone with the appropriate collateral by structuring the loan as a purchase and sale. It could even give money away um, by agreeing to accept less for resale than it paid when it purchased the security initially. Um, so I've been doing some research on the history of these operations. And obviously, the Fed's present leadership can take comfort in the fact that the Fed has been stretching six, Section 14 in this way for over 100 years. Um, the first time the Fed did what I'd call open market lending was in 1917. Uh, and Congress objected when it found out in the 1920s. And when the Fed started doing it at scale again in the 1950s, Congress objected again. Um, and at one point in the 20s, even the Fed's own lawyers concluded that it was ultra virus. But it's been going on for a very long time. So what to make of all of this? Plainly, US law is out of sync in a lot of respects with present day realities. And this mismatch has costs. It has costs in terms of efficacy and preparedness and costs in terms of equity and legitimacy. And when the public health crisis is resolved, it seems like Congress ought to take a hard look at our statutory framework for money and banking. If the treasury um, is gonna have to invest every time the Fed engages in emergency lending, Congress probably ought to appropriate a standing fund for that as Jeff has recommended. Um, and if shadow banks are going to need a government backstop in every business cycle downturn, Congress should consider formalizing that and treating them more like banks. Um, so while the Fed has the defense of necessity here, Congress really doesn't. Um, so thank you. And uh, let me turn things over to Kate. All right. Well, thank you very much for that. Um, and I'm really going to pick up where I left, left off. 
So I'm both gonna, I'll start by pushing back a little bit. So, so as Fed, uh, as Lev very nicely described, the, the Fed's work over the past month has been absolutely outstanding. So uh, in terms of uh, how aggressive um, it has been. And, and I think unlike Fed, uh, Lev, I actually think a lot of it has been incredibly impressive. So I would say 80% is awe-inspiring, um, incredibly creative, incredibly aggressive, and very helpful efforts to try to respond to an unprecedented shock to the real economy. However, like Lev, I have that 20% fear, um, but it's coming from slightly different places. So let me start by uh, saying where we are in slightly different places. And one, a lot of what the Fed is doing right now, as Lev already mentioned, are things that we have seen the Federal Reserve do. So I have less concern than he does between the, the supposed mismatch between the, the animating statute and what the Fed has actually been doing, because as he nicely described at the end, these practices have evolved over decades and in some cases is over a century. And as a practical matter, financial markets, how we go about financial intermediation has evolved dramatically and the Fed's practices have evolved alongside of it. And Congress has observed all of those changes and Congress has gone in and very specifically said to the Fed, we want you to do this, we don't want you to do that in a whole variety of other areas. And at other times they've been very okay with what the Fed has done. So in terms of the, the swap lines and the new repo facility for, for foreign banks, I think it's dealing with a reality where you have US dollar denominated assets floating throughout financial markets um, in many non-US spaces and a demand for US dollar liquidity in those markets. And so if we want to be able to try to promote overall market functioning, uh, both in the US, but also do what we can to, to alleviate frictions abroad, I think providing some liquidity to foreign central banks that they can pass on to their institutions actually reduces the pressure the Fed would otherwise face uh, because those institutions sometimes have US operations to provide those institutions direct support. So I think that the interactions with foreign central banks are a reflection of the, the role of the US dollars in international markets. Similarly, as he noted, uh, after the last crisis and in this crisis, the Fed has had to do a lot to try to shore up short-term markets. And that's true both in banking and in non-banking. So we saw them quickly ramping up a whole variety of facilities that were meant to say, we want the short-term markets to function as well as they possibly can. And, and I think longer term, he's right. There might be some reform issues that we need to think about in certain areas like money market mutual funds. But on the whole, that's not inconsistent with what we're used to the Fed doing. What we're used to central banks doing and what they're institutionally well suited to do is to say we're going to provide a huge amount of liquidity on the shorter ends. Short term markets is where dysfunction tends to erupt earlier on because people are in these markets precisely because they want safety. So as soon as there's a lack of safety, there's a fleeing from these markets. And by going in and providing liquidity uh, to the, the major players in these markets, the Fed is trying to minimize the degree to which disruption in the short-term space spills over and affects longer-term markets and then impedes the ability of the institutions that we rely on for credit creation. So I um, understand some of the qualms, but I think this is something we've seen the Fed do before. They are doing it on a different scale. I think unlimited quantitative easing is something that we've not seen previously. It is resulting in a ballooning of the Fed's balance sheet but I think that is consistent with the fact that we have a, a central bank in the US that explicitly has a dual mandate. And so in an environment when there's basically zero inflationary pressures and unemployment is soaring for the Fed to act incredibly aggressively to try to deal with the, the dysfunction in the financial markets that are stemming from this shock to the real economy is not all of that surprising and, and not necessarily inappropriate. Where, where Lev and I do share some of our concerns is that we are seeing not just that support for the, the, the short-term markets, both through banks and non-banks, which is how the, the economy now functions, but a recognition that there are such limitations in terms of the extension of credit um, and such noise and uncertainty regarding the, the nature of the economic shock that if we really wanna have 
uh, businesses come through the other side, we are going to need longer term credit creation. And as Lev pointed out, but I really want to flag how different this is than last time, what Congress did in the CARES Act was to effectively say the fiscal support that we're going to have go to businesses, we're going to set aside some money just for small businesses, and that's going to be run by Treasury. But beyond that, the $554 billion that we want in fiscal support to maintain the, the, the business side of our economy, we want all of that money to flow through Fed facilities. It's going to be given to Treasury, but Treasury has to spend it through Fed facilities. Contrast this to 2008, where what Congress said was, we really need money to be spent to shore up this overall system, but naturally, Congress is never going to be able to figure out those details. So they had to pass on discretion to somebody else. And there they said, we're going to give Treasury the discretion to figure out how to utilize that money. And originally it was utilized. Uh, the idea was to buy troubled assets that quickly was abandoned. And so instead, we saw a recapitalization of the banking system and then subsequently other efforts, including at that point, the model for what we see in the CARES Act, where some of those TARP funds ended up in the original TALF facility, which was the facility, again, to facilitate those, those asset-backed securitizations, to facilitate that as a mechanism of funding. This time around, nobody liked the idea of a slush fund that Treasury could control, and that's the language that started getting used. So they said, we're going to put some, uh, a check on what the Treasury can do by forcing it all to go through Fed facilities. But we are facing this unprecedented shock to the real economy, so we just don't know where things are going to play out. And the real challenge is both because of the legal constraints that 13.3 imposes, that, that Lev beautifully laid out, but also because of practical institutional constraints. The Fed is not well positioned to try to help out all of the different borrowers who might need an equal degree of help. So in particular, if we're trying to get to the other side of the, the shock that we're currently experiencing, and we want the economy to be as well positioned to grow afterwards, we want to have the, the businesses, the, the functional businesses in a position so that they can return and provide the goods and services that people want, and that they are still employing all of their workers, so there's actually demand for those goods and services. So we want that the business functioning to, to actually live out on the other side. So first of all, where we should provide them a lot of support are small and mid-sized enterprises, because not only are they a huge portion of in terms of the economic activity for GDP and employment, but we know if they have to go through bankruptcy, they are disproportionately likely to be forced into a liquidation that actually destroys the business. So we should want a lot more funding to be flowing to the small and mid-sized enterprises that just can't go through uh, a bankruptcy proceeding. But of course, as Lev pointed out, that's the absolute opposite of what the Fed is well situated to do. The Fed already has two separate facilities in place to support the largest, most credit worthy uh, corporations. And it's not because they like those corporations more, it's because they can use a proxy of were you investment grade or not as of a certain date before COVID really set in. And that's gonna determine whether or not we can provide you funding. And so we're relying on the hard work already done by not just the credit rating agencies, but the rich informational environment that these large corporations are otherwise operating in. So the Fed can provide them a lot of liquidity. But then they're not just protecting the business, what they're really protecting are the creditors and the shareholders. And there's some of these businesses that probably should go through something like a resolution proceeding, where what we're doing is forcing the shareholders to, to lose out, forcing haircuts on creditors, but really protecting the business enterprise. Whereas in protecting the shareholders and the creditors, there's the possibility that what they're going to do is shrink the footprint. We want to maintain that footprint. They might rationally shrink the footprint and instead uh, kind of keep alive, um, you know, their long-term their long term economic interest. So unlike Lev, I think the Fed is actually trying incredibly hard with the tools that it has available to them. Uh, or I guess we agree on that. Um, they are trying incredibly hard, and I think they have done actually an incredible job for the creativity and how quickly they've created a whole variety of different funding facilities. But the real challenge 
is for fiscal support where it most needs to go is to smaller and mid-sized businesses. And there the main street lending facility is slowly getting off the ground, um, but it's really difficult uh, because again, it's harder to screen businesses in this area. And for the small businesses, the, the backup to the PPP is basically only saying, we're gonna help with the government's already doing, but we're not otherwise well suited to make sure that these are in well, uh, well functioning corporations that we want to extend credit to. So I think we're seeing as a result of an um, institutional mismatch, as much of a legal mismatch, um, so, some inequities arising over who has access to new financing as a result in contrast to who really should have access to that financing and the terms of that financing given the central role that the Fed is paying. Two other quick things to note, as Lev mentioned, one of the, the challenges that we're facing right now is precisely because the Fed has been so active. Uh, whenever something is going wrong, everybody's looking right now to the Fed to solve it. So states and municipalities desperately need much more financing. And one of the things Congress in the US is fighting about is whether or not to give them more financing. But that's being translated in to pressure on the Fed to provide that financing. And they're calling it liquidity, but two years is not liquidity. And as a practical matter, they're doing their best to figure out, okay, well, what are the, the terms that we should provide financing on? But of course, as soon as they rolled out their program, there was a great piece by Aaron Klein and one of his colleagues at Brookings that shows, actually, there's racial disparities in the municipalities that are gonna have access to the financing. And if you look at the 35 cities that have the greatest uh, African-American populations, including places like Baltimore, Atlanta, Detroit, none of them are gonna have access. To, to the new facility. And those are precisely the types of questions the Fed has spent decades working very, very hard to avoid and that they are not well suited to try to address. But because we're seeing such unevenness between are you an entity that is able to be backed up by some kind of Fed facility versus are you not, everybody wants to have access to that Fed facility and they're being forced to answer all these difficult questions. We're also seeing that right now with mortgage servicing. There's huge problems in mortgage servicing that could have very real impacts on housing markets and the well-being of home loan, of the, the borrowers on those home loans. And now pressure is being brought to bear on the Fed as opposed to the Federal Housing Finance Agency because the, the chief there has effectively said um, he's not going to do that much to deal with it. So I think the, the Fed on the whole is doing the best it can under very difficult circumstances. But I think the real challenge that we're facing is the set of tools available to the Fed are poorly suited to where the greatest needs are if the goal is to, to minimize the short-term shock and, and set us up for growth. And, and so the, the inability to find better ways, um, and in particular, to find other institutions within the administration that we're willing to trust with significant discretion is limiting right now the, the capacity of the, of the overall government response to really map well onto where the, the greatest needs are and to make sure that we are as viable as possible uh, to recover from the shock once the, the, the public health concerns have started to, to disappear. So thank you all very much. Passing it on to Jack Coffee. Are you hearing me? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, I'm a little nervous that our audience may be getting overloaded with statutory language and complex tables. So let me say I'm going to try to focus on general principles. And those general principles begin with the CARES Act. The CARES Act is the centerpiece of the US Congress's attempt to give an economic response to the pandemic. It was written under intense time pressure and with an absolute minimum of transparency. And as a result, uh, you can find in it some uh, surprising windfalls to the financial community, which bear the uh, fingerprints of a number of lobbyists. That's not my focus. I do recognize that when Wall Street sees a federal subsidy, the first thing it thinks is, charity begins at home. But the principles that I want to focus on are the basic strategy that the CARES Act uses. Essentially, the CARES Act relies on banks 
to make loans, loans that will be guaranteed by a federal agency, the Small Business Administration, and which will carry a very low interest rate, 1%. Which loans are to go to employers to cover their payroll costs, their rent, other, certain other expenses to keep these small businesses from failing and going into bankruptcy? And like uh, Kate Judge, I believe that's a very valid goal. The question is the means that have been chosen implemented. The means that have been essentially chosen are guaranteed loans involving an intermediary, banks and other lenders, and a federal agency that will put a guarantee on these loans. Got no problem at all with the goal of passing this money to employees who are destitute and desperate. But is this the best strategy, the best technique to use? In making any comparison between this and other alternatives, I think there are four criteria that have to stand out. First, relative administration costs, or if you want, transaction costs. Two, speed. Uh, it's, as, it's as if we were trying to deliver oxygen to someone who couldn't breathe. A bureaucrat who gets that oxygen to him three months later is giving it to a corpse and really hasn't succeeded. We've got to get this done as fast as possible. Three, bias. Is the intermediary we are using somewhat biased? Will it improperly favor some over others? Okay, that's the third factor. Fourth, overbreadth. Does this subsidy subsidize the rich as well as the poor? Or after, after all, this is always going to be supported by the taxpayer in the last analysis, and taxpayers aren't going to like all this money going to rich firms, including hedge funds and private equity firms that are right now applying for these loans. On each of these four grounds, costs, speed, bias, and overbreadth, I think the use of banks as the central intermediary and a government agency guaranteeing the loans as an allied intermediary probably was the wrong decision. Let me go through these four criteria and explain. First, in terms of administrative cost, the Small Business Administration is required by the statute to pay each lender between 5% and 1% of the loan. So on a $1 million loan, there's a 30,000 fee going to the bank. The bank is taking no risk because this is all guaranteed by the federal government and the bank has very little to do. This is fairly low level clerical work in supervising the application filed by the borrower uh, with the bank and the Small Business Administration. Okay, if you look at the cost though of these fees to the banks, if the full 349 billion that's been authorized under the CARES Act's payroll protection plan is paid out, and it should be paid out by the end of today probably, uh, that would cost the federal government something like $14 billion in payments to banks for these loans. It could be higher, it could be lower, but that's pretty much the ballpark around 14 billion. It's very expensive for work that is basically clerical work that doesn't require any detailed analysis. Okay, now let's move to speed. In terms of speed, the borrower must first find a bank that will sponsor its loan application. That can take some time, particularly when these loans are all being made on a first come first serve basis. Uh, and then that loan application goes to the Small Business Administration, a fairly slow moving federal agency. After all that, even after the loan is approved, there may still have to be a closing with all the ritualistic formalities that banks and lawyers bring to a closing. All this can take time. Uh, at this point, the uh, SBA says it's approved some 100, mil 100 billion uh, in loans, or a million loans covering about 141 billion uh, as of last week. However, almost nothing in that amount has been dispersed and paid out because approving is easy, getting the money out into the hands of the borrower has taken that agency and the banks a much longer time. Next, third factor, bias. Banks have an obvious self-interest in favoring their larger, stronger, more well-heeled customers. And there are plenty of customers that are technically small businesses, having less than 500 employees that are quite large. Uh, loans are being made to these on a first come first serve basis and the smaller lend, the smaller borrower, the solo proprietor, are complaining vociferously that they cannot get the attention of their bank because the bank is busy with the bigger client. Uh, 
That's an inevitable bias when you let banks choose between their customers because they can't service them all at once. Lastly, my fourth criteria, overbreadth. Nowhere in the CARES Act is there any requirement that a borrower uh, has to be losing money or in some financial distress. As a reality right now, hedge funds and private equity funds have applied for loans because they do have less than 500 employees, and that's the principal criterion. And frankly, everyone, me included, would like a 1% loan. A properly administered system would have different criteria. It would require that the borrower be in some level of financial distress so that it was likely it was going to have to lay off employees. Right now, the most profitable firms in the country are the trading firms. They have record profits these last three months, and yet they're also getting a subsidy because they're eligible to apply under this program. Okay. Uh, as to executive compensation, yeah, you can't loan a million dollars to a CEO but you're allowed to loan the first $100,000 of anyone's compensation. So if I were to run a hedge fund, just as an example, I might have four employees that are making more than a half million dollars a year, and all of those people and me can get a $100,000 loan given to the employer based on our first 100,000 being eligible for a loan. All of that is allowing the subsidy to go to the wealthy rather than the poor, and I think that's a misapplication. So I'm gonna sum this up fairly quickly. What are the lessons to be learned here? I think there are three, and I think they are general principles. First, banks may be an unnecessary intermediary. In this kind of case, we're really not worried about the credit worthiness of the borrower. Banks are simply consuming time, they are costly, they slow down the process, and a federal agency that guarantees loans is not adding much either because the government expects that these loans are going to never be repaid, all right? Uh, that's the first point. We've chosen the wrong intermediary. What's the alternative? The alternative is the government could directly make the loan to the employer. The employer would file its loan application with the government, whether it's the treasury or some other intermediary, uh, not with the bank. Uh, and it, when you make that certification to the government, you'd have to tell them the relevant information, the size of your payroll, your recent problems, whether you'd be able to pay that payroll, and all the other details the government wants to know from the standpoint of an equitably distributed subsidy. That could be done quickly without either a bank or the second intermediary, the Small Business Administration, being involved in the process. Third point, uh, well, that second point, for. Uh, the subsidy should be limited to only small businesses that are in some distress, that are losing money. A very profitable small business should not be given a 1% loan to pay its employees when possibly those employees are happy as a pig in mud making a good deal of money. Uh, those companies do exist, okay? I think that the subsidy should be limited to firms that are in distress that otherwise would have to lay off employees, and that should be part of the certification process to the government. By the way, if you lie to the government and make a false certification, that triggers federal felonies, and there's a lot more enforcement that way, and there'd be less fraud under this direct loan to the government, direct loan from the government approach. Third and finally, uh, the Small Business Administration is probably the wrong intermediary to choose. Uh, it's got a history of being operating on a fairly small level. Last year in 2019, it made something like 60,000 loans. This year, it needs to make several million loans. And it may have approved several million loans, but it hasn't shown the ability to disperse the money. Who can disperse the money? We have just seen the IRS do it in a fairly successful operation. They are mailing a check for 1,200 to all eligible citizens in the United States, and that's many millions. They can scale up to high volume. They have lots of information about these borrowers and their use on dealing on a large scale. That would be a better intermediary, and it's better at enforcement as well. Bottom line, the technique here, the mechanism of a guaranteed loan has only precedent to recommend it. People looking for an answer turned to what had been done in the past, and they said, we've given guarantee loans in the past. Yes, we have, and lawyers love precedent, but it was probably not the right procedure to follow. 
I think what we have to recognize is that simplicity is critical here and simplicity does not come from using banks and a guaranteed loan procedure as your mechanism. Instead, direct loans from the government to the borrower based on applications filed with the government would be quicker and it would allow the government to better aim the subsidy at those who truly deserve it. On that note, I'll finish a minute early and pass the baton on to the next speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jack. It's now Todd Baker. Uh, there we go. Yes. Good morning, everyone uh, here. Uh, I very much enjoy hearing from Love and Catherine and John with their perspectives on the uh, small business aspects of uh, our current crisis. I want to shift the focus uh, somewhat uh, to focus less on the um, issues with the existing uh, Paycheck Protection Program and look onto what, what has to happen next uh, in order for small businesses to survive in the U.S. Um, most of the other speakers have spoken already about the importance of small business in the economy, more or less half of the U.S. economy, so I won't go there. I would like to uh, uh, echo the uh, concerns about using banks as intermediary middlemen, banks and other types of lenders. Um, clearly, um, one takeaway from this is uh, going to be the need to provide more direct uh, funding mechanisms, both for individuals and small businesses. Um, you know, one of the reasons uh, that John was citing, uh, I think we need to um, uh, focus on a little more carefully, which is uh, the government's reliance on lending and quasi-lending solutions. Um, uh, clearly suboptimal, um, uh, largely because the middlemen have um, internal conflicts and, and challenges uh, with uh, respect to the government goals. Middlemen are concerned about their own capital and liquidity, profitability, what their customers want, the need to preserve their own customers. The government is interested in distributing money uh, fast and effectively. Those um, goals are fundamentally uh, in conflict and one of the reasons why uh, using uh, financial services entities as middlemen in crisis like this, probably some suboptimal. Uh, let me talk about what happens uh, after PPP. Um, we're gonna assume that PPP gets perhaps extended and point, but uh, pretty quickly, we're going to be focused on uh, what happens after. And the problem, of course, for a market-based system is uh, uncertainty will be the rule of the day. The epidemiology is unclear. Uh, there will be shutdown reversals at various times. There will probably be additional shutdowns in areas where the virus um, expands. There, were, there are unknown changes in consumer and small business behavior. Uh, all of those uncertainties um, are going to be very difficult for um, financial services providers who typically focus on providing uh, or on uh, picking winners from losers. Uh, when they lend. They're looking to lend to entities that are going to be survivors uh, and prosper um, and looking not to lend to those who, uh, who are going to be rendered permanently uh, insolvent or bankrupt um, as a result of this um, effort. And that creates a political ch challenge because it's not clear uh, what the government plan is, whether their intention is or their belief is that the goal here is to re, uh, restore the status quo ante with everyone who was in business prior to the crisis re remaining in business or whether they have some different goal about um, emphasizing the stronger and letting the, the weak um, uh, fail. Uh, in this world of uncertainty, the market uh, will, perform, uh, will provide little or no new credit. Um, the, uh, Key issues are that uh, lenders uh, today rely on statistical um, credit models for credit analysis. Um, the correlations that they rely on looking backwards are no longer going to be relevant in a, a changed environment. Um, in order to pick winners and losers, they'll have to look at uh, cash flows rather than um, the way they often look at uh, credit scoring, particularly on the small uh, end of um, individual and business uh, decisions. Um, looking at cash flow uh, is essentially a non-scalable process, so it limits how much they can do. Um, there are uh, benefits that have come from the fintech um, 
uh, aggregators of data. And so over time, an ability to shift to a cash flow analysis will uh, uh, increase, but it, it's not going to be immediately uh, possible. Risk tolerances in any financial services entity are going to be extremely low because the existing portfolio is the main concern and that portfolio is um, going to be um, suffering badly. There uh, are or will likely be no secondary market outlets uh, uh, or, and or the uh, cost of using secondary markets will be prohibitively expensive. Um, th that combination of things suggests that lending from the private sector uh, unsubsidized is not likely to uh, return anytime soon after the end of the PPP and therefore the government subsidies are likely to be required for an indeterminate period. So uh, what are ways that uh, we could think about this? I, I tend to think about the uh, recovery in four stages. The first stage being the um, uh, PPP uh, emergency um, effort to shovel money to small businesses uh, through the banking system. Uh, but after that, there are at least uh, three other stages. The second stage is probably some form of direct government lending support for uh, traditional small business lending. Uh, probably, uh, and uh, looking at what Lev and um, uh, Kate said earlier, some kind of direct secured line of credit uh, from the Federal Reserve Banks with a Treasury um, guarantee of some kind to comply with the 13.3 requirements. Uh, perhaps the PPP loan facility can be a model. But there are some critical questions that we have to answer in the second stage. The first being, is this an effort to, re to retain the status quo ante with regard to small business? Or is there some aspect of picking in winners and losers in a post-COVID world? Um, is it going to be indiscriminate lending with no credit analysis like the PPP? Or is it going to be um, credit-driven uh, decision-making? And will there, if it is credit-based decision-making, will there be a need for some sort of risk-sharing with lenders and what, how will that affect the effectiveness of the program? Um, question we all need to ask is this winner or loser question, is this an inherently political question or is this one that we're gonna expect lenders to make and if so, how? Um, we'll also need to focus on what type of loans, um, the extent of term, price, interest rate, fee incentives, et cetera. But my view is that uh, lending uh, will not re uh, return in any meaningful way for small businesses without um, uh, a direct government support for at least some period of time. The next stage, stage three, is probably about uh, supporting a revival in the secondary market for loans. This is especially important for the non-banks, which I'll talk about briefly in a minute. Um, as the ability to look at credit in traditional ways returns, as the economy um, uh, re retains some type, type of stability, whether it be a prosperous stability or a depressed stability, um, there will still be a need to uh, support a return to the asset-backed securities markets for small business loans. Um, probably that involves a, a new type of um, small business asset-backed securities liquidity facility uh, modeled on the TALF, um, supporting um, purchases, uh, holders of uh, invest investment grade securities um, backed by small business loans. And investment grade is, is a critical distinction because most small business asset backed securities in the period leading up to the crisis, while they were investment grade, they were not AAA. So this is an, an element of credit um, uh, going deeper down the credit uh, spectrum than the, than the Fed has typically been willing to do under its 13.3 powers. Uh, that obviously makes the uh, importance of the Treasury guarantee uh, even more significant. Uh, if such a facility exists, over time it will enable a gradual uh, revival of standard lending uh, to small businesses, especially by non-banks. Uh, the last stage is what I'd refer to as really the great unwinding because uh, along with all the other Fed support programs, uh, the, the small business support program will need to be unwound along with um, uh, and the um, uh, asset back facility as well. And at that point, we'll need to think about lessons learned. And the, the two biggest concerns, one of which has been addressed by other speakers, is the direct mechanism 
for um, getting assistance to small businesses that doesn't require intermediation through banks and, and non-bank lenders. But there is another major concern I'd like to flag, which is the systemic uh, risk of the online lenders um, who have been uh, big players in the uh, small business lending markets and completely um, unable to respond in this crisis. So small business lending uh, since the 2008 crisis has changed quite substantially. About a quarter to a third of all small business credit now comes from non-bank, uh, primarily fintech lenders, both very large and a number of uh, uh, smaller ones. Um, their, their advantage is they're fast and easy and competitively priced. Uh, the sector has been growing very fast and they're state licensed and, be and beyond direct federal regulatory control. Uh, they, um, uh, as has been noted by um, uh, various people, including myself, have an inherently fragile business model. They're fundamentally finance companies who borrow in the capital markets to lend to small uh, businesses. That model always breaks down in a crisis when borrowing costs and availability become an issue. Um, they also have a, a large number of them are what are known as marketplace lenders, which is an even more fragile business because a marketplace lender doesn't have a balance sheet and needs to sell the next loan to generate any revenue. And when it uh, can't sell loans, uh, it can't generate revenue and quickly goes out of business. Uh, center of all this is when credit spreads spike as they have, um, marketplace lenders and, and other online small business lenders uh, stop lending. Uh, they have been authorized to participate in the PPP, but they were authorized too late to originate uh, significant um, credit to their existing borrowers, which as I said, make up about a quarter to a third of all small businesses, particularly the smallest of small businesses. Uh, and the, while the PPP loan facility indicates that it may at some point in the future include them, uh, it has not done so uh, to date. And the uh, challenge for them is uh, secondary market access. So um, what should we uh, think when we look at uh, them in the future? They uh, appear uh, to have created a, a new and unrecognized um, systemic risk in our uh, small business system. Um, they play a very large role in their fragility, makes them less um, resilient than depository banks. Um, they are, as I mentioned, beyond direct federal regulatory control. The questions we need to ask is why should the government rescue lenders that have made themselves, could have made themselves substantially less risky? In other words, they chose a business model which made them uh, unable to provide credit to their customers uh, in a, when times became difficult. And that leads to the question, um, uh, should, uh, lending to critical areas like this in the U.S. economy be in some way restricted to banks who are uh, both liquid and have capital in this circumstance and are subject to much higher level regulatory controls. And the last question I'd raise is where was the Financial Mobility um, Oversight Council um, during the last uh, 10 years as uh, the small business lending market changed fundamentally with um, clearly visible risks that were not recognized and not um, considered um, uh, uh, as significant risks coming into this crisis. I think the uh, fundamental question is, uh, how do we feel about a system uh, that um, is unable to respond uh, in a, a crisis uh, because as um, many have noted, um, our last attempt at regulatory reform in 2008 effectively pushed many um, riskier lenders out of the banking system. Well, now we're paying that price as those lenders are unable to respond for the millions of customers that um, rely on them. That's it for me, so I'll pass it on to whoever is next. Uh, Todd, thank you very much. Um, frightening talk, actually. Um, uh, Eric Talley. Hey, thanks, Jeff, and uh, thanks to the organizers for putting this program together. I've been tuning in intermittently since last night, and the and the uh, the program is terrific uh, thus far. I'm gonna try. Let me see if I can do this. I'm gonna try to share my screen here uh, to give you guys a little bit of a uh, little bit of eye candy. Let's see if I can make this happen. Um, just a second, sorry. Okay, and I'm gonna do this, share, oh, there it is. 
Okay, so hopefully you can see that. Uh, so this is um, a, uh, a uh, presentation that's based on a paper uh, that is uh, currently available if you're interested in the underlying uh, in, in the underlying paper itself. It's up on SSRN and you can download it. Um, <clears throat> and this is a paper, there was actually an earlier, uh, earlier decision by our uh, earlier uh, presentation uh, from South Korea by uh, Professor Shun about uh, force majeure provisions in corporate transactions as well. This one's gonna take a little bit more of a quantitative uh, and empirical approach, uh, but uh, the, the, the key question is fundamentally uh, the same as to what extent does the coronavirus, the COVID-19 pandemic constitute a force majeure in large corporate transactions focusing specifically on M&A. And um, if, uh, I, I think probably this audience is already sort of interested in this topic, but uh, to give you added motivation, realize that uh, pending deals right now, we, anticipate, we, we estimate uh, well north of a half trillion dollars in pending transactions waiting to close as of April 1st. Uh, those uh, closings can represent significant liquidity events, positive for the sellers and cash deals, negative for the buyers. Even in stock deals, there are non-trivial uh, implications about risk distribution. And, um, and this is kind of an interesting moment for contract law generally. It's likely that we're going to see some uh, degree of sea change in how this uh, particular area of law is, uh, is uh, adjudicated and regulated. So uh, let me just give you, set the stage a little bit. I think this is familiar to most, peop most people, but in general or generic contract law, we refer to a force majeure, uh, literally meaning superior force. We're essentially uh, trying to articulate con uh, contingencies under which a party to a contract is allowed to walk, usually because it ha the, the contingency is unexpected and has a significant effect on their underlying valuation of the underlying uh, transaction. In corporate and M&A practice, the specialized terminology for this is a material adverse change or a material adverse effect provision. These are ubiquitous in M&A deals, asset purchases, and financing. They're also kind of interestingly enough heavily negotiated. Unlike a lot of boilerplate or boilerplate aspects to corporate acquisitions, uh, these are these tend to be a little bit more bespoke in nature, and they often get disputed in times of economic distress. This goes back about 10 years to the last big moment of economic distress where we saw uh, a crop of disputed MAE provisions as well. Like I said, there are a lot of uh, transactions currently hanging in the, in the balance that, uh, that uh, are likely going to, uh, to hinge, at least in part, on how the parties proceed under their MAE provisions. Uh, it's also important to note that, that you don't have to have one of these provisions in most jurisdictions to have what is implicitly a force majeure doctrine in the background. Common law has long had a, a relatively conservative doctrine of frustration and impracticability. German civil code, the French civil code actually uh, codify that. Some jurisdictions, Japan, don't really have one, but allow you to contract for it. And in all the settings we're going to be talking about, M&A deals include an express um, uh, force majeure provision that essentially either adds to or more likely supplants that background doctrine. Let me give you an example of what one of these provisions look like. Uh, this, is a, uh, this is a provision from the uh, E-Trade um, uh, Morgan Stanley deal from earlier this year. I've color coded this force majeure provision uh, because it tends to be dissectable in ways that are, uh, I like to analogize to a piece of Swiss cheese. Uh, the green text basically de delineates a very general swath of situations under which the buyer in this instance is going to be able to walk away from the deal. And the language that is used here uh, is both circular and very conventional. It basically says, look, if there's anything that's going to be a financial, financially impair the liabilities, assets, business or operations of the company or, or subsidiaries taken out as a whole, that's going to constitute an MAE. Uh, there are also holes in the Swiss cheese, which are essentially explicit, much more targeted carve-outs. And this particular MAE has many of them. I've highlighted one of them that's particularly relevant here, Acts of God, and in particular, the, the enumerated contingency of a pandemic or a disease such as the COVID-19 virus. So this was a deal that got negotiated during, you know, while this virus was spreading out of uh, East Asia and into the rest of the world. And it's a pretty typical sort of exclusion. It's, and what's nice about it, this as an example, is that it's got both a, a general provision and it's got a specific provision that, that, that says pandemic or disease. Uh, so you both have acts of God, which arguably could mean disease, but also a specifically enumerated uh, provision. So this was a project that we were already engaged in in trying to study the architecture and, and structure of MAEs. And so it was pretty easy to repurpose it 
to this particular approach. Uh, this goes back, the, the deals we're examining over 1700 go, go back to about 2003 and end in late March, 2020. Uh, the prevalence with which uh, these types of carve outs exist is on the left hand side here. Force majeure, act of God, calamities tend to be the most frequently used general provision, but also a non-trivial number of specific uh, provisions, pandemic, epidemics, and, uh, and so forth. And so, um, and so you can see also that historically, while a specific carve out's uh, been uh, related to about, uh, about half, half or 12% 12, 12 of the deals, it's been growing over time and has become much more common uh, over the last uh, couple of years. So uh, just to, to get a sense of, of, of where that goes or where that's been going, here's the trajectory of both general and specific language uh, that, that might be related to pandemics. Uh, you'll see that the general language, force majeure, act of God, started to pick up in the early 2000s. You didn't really see any pandemic specific enumerated exclusions until around 2009, which coincides with the H1N1 crisis. Uh, and uh, it ends up picking up steam through the MERS crises in the 2015, 2016, and has really picked up steam uh, this year. Uh, those of you who know this area also know that once you carve something out, it's possible to carve parts of it back in. And a lot of these provisions do that by having so-called disproportional effects language. So you can almost view this as having cheese that you put back in to partially fill up one of those holes. And a very common one is to say, well, look, we've carved out this particular contingency, but if it affects this target company in a way that's disproportional to some set of, of uh, comparator groups, usually um, companies in its, in its peer group, then that's gonna count once again as being a material adverse effect. And over 90% of the deals that we have access to uh, include that type of carve out uh, provision. Uh, also interesting worth thinking about is to what extent does uh, do general and specific carve outs overlap? Uh, it turns out it was roughly evenly split um, for through the entirety of the data set. But of currently pending deals, it's sort of two thirds of them that have, uh, that have a specific disease or pandemic carve out marry that as an enumerated example of an act of God, force majeure, calamity. And that can matter from an interpretational perspective. If you have a general carve out, but not a specific one, uh, how is it that you're gonna be able to argue that this wasn't on your mind when contemporaneous deals were specifically carving it out? So kind of some, some interesting possibilities for legal argumentation there uh, as well. The ones that specifically carve it out, like the E-Trade deal, uh, are almost certainly um, uh, uh, not going to get uh, hamstrung on the basis of their, their MAE. Uh, so how easy is it going to be to, uh, to uh, back out of these deals? You know, our, our sense, and I think probably if you teach in this area or do research in this area, is it's not going to be very easy, even if you don't have one of these explicit pandemic uh, carve outs. Uh, and, and this in part just has to do with the legal posture in which you've got a party that is trying to bust up a deal. Uh, it's generally the case that the burden of proof is imposed on that party. These, these conditions are, are usually interpreted as conditions subsequent, meaning that they have the burden of proof. The precedent's pretty one-sided. There was a late 18, uh, 2018 case, Acorn versus Fresenius, uh, a VC Laster case, which was essentially the first one in Delaware to have allowed a buyer to walk away, but that really was based on, on fairly sui, sui generous facts. Most of the other ones, pretty much all the other ones in Delaware uh, cut the other way. I should also note that there's a, a risk to engaging in the type of foot dragging you'd need to do to say, hey, we don't want to close and maybe we're going to trigger the MAE. There can be other provisions in the deal, like an efforts provision, that's, that are really going to hamstring you uh, as well. Um, so it's, not, it's going to be a bit of an uphill slog, I think, for buyers who are thinking about trying to bail out on these deals. Does that mean that rueful buyers aren't going to try it? Don't bet your life on it. There's a, there are actually still some advantages to uh, to deciding that you are going to um, that, that you're going to uh, 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 invoke a, 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 an MAE. And I think I have frozen. Can you guys still hear me? Yes. Yes, we can okay. hear you. All right. So my screen has frozen. So I'll just walk my, my the rest of my way through. Uh, so uh, there can be liquidity reasons why you would essentially want to uh, want to invoke an MAE that can be uh, fairly uh, fairly uh, substantial, particularly if uh, you're about to suffer a negative liquidity event as a buyer. Uh, even if you were to delay the, the the outcome for some period of time, uh, then uh, you, you still uh, are going to be able to maintain at least short-term liquidity, and that's still an issue 
in, uh, in the current environment. Second, you're gonna be able to buy some time maybe to assemble the case for being able to invoke your MAE. And then finally, the, the MAE provision is really just one of a whole set of, uh, of uh, different tools that might be used. Uh, some of them have to do with other provisions in either the closing conditions or optionality that's provided to the buyer. So in the paper, we go over it. I was gonna show you some eye candy here of the extent to which uh, um, reverse termination fees are correlated with uh, the, the, the permissiveness of the underlying MAE. It turns out that they're not highly correlated, at least the extent that you have them. Uh, RTFs are pretty much you know, about half the deals that have carve outs dealing with pandemics have RTFs uh, as well. Uh, they tend to be a little bit more complementary with a buyer permissive RTF uh, when, uh, when, um, when it comes to the price of, of exercising that reverse termination fee. That uh, when you don't have that many exclusions, it also tends to be a slightly lower uh, uh, termination fee uh, that you've got to pay. Uh, but uh, we already have, have, uh, have seen at least four cases that arguably are going to invoke some form of change circumstances or force majeure or the No, your voice froze. Eric, are you there? Oops. Uh, somehow we seem to have lost Eric. I'm going to um, see if I can email him and figure out what's happened. Um, But I think um, probably what we need to do is um, is to is to um, move to the next panelist on the theory that whatever happened to Eric was. Uh, fairly dramatic. Um, so uh, and maybe he will return. Uh, so um, Katerina Pistor is um, the next speaker. Hello, everyone. Um, I hope you can hear me. Jeff, can you just give me the thumbs up? Uh, yes, yes, we can hear you. Thank you. So thank you so much for joining in into this marathon and giving me an opportunity to speak uh, to you. I will basically present not a fully written paper, it's mostly a, a thought piece or an exercise in thinking through some issues that I've been toying with in my book, The Code of Capital, and I'm extending this to, uh, uh, to uh, recent developments in financial markets and of course in the context of the corona epidemic. Um, so let me just start by laying out the groundwork. Um, so my, the title, as you saw, was basically corporate finance in the age of shadow banking. And just to sort of basically set the stage here, I define with Merling et al. shadow banking as money market funding of capital market lending. And we are, of course, familiar with the legal techniques that have been used. Um, we know them well from um, the securitization of mortgages and other assets. We use collateralization. We use securitization. We're using all the tools that I call the modules of the code of capital in my book. And of course, we add to them corporate law and trust law, um, contract law, property law. Um, these are, of course, the very same techniques that we've used for um, securitization, so securitizing mortgages. We can really substitute different assets, and we have seen this in the markets. So any kind of receivables can, in principle, be securitized and fed into the shadow banking system. So can corporate shares and bonds and also sovereign debt. And, of course, my focus today will be mostly on, on corporate securities. Um, the goal of um, creating a shadow banking or parallel banking system is to sidestep the need for prudential liquidity governance, which is costly and which has been imposed on banks for, you know, um, a little over um, two centuries now for pretty good, maybe one and a half centuries to be more accurate, since the mid-19th century, for pretty good reasons because of the volatility of the system 
system that lacks some kind of um, liquidity backstopping. And I think we're just seeing once more that liquidity backstopping is key for shadow banking. The question is always whether it just lands, the mess lands on the balance sheets of the banks and then on the balance sheet of the central banks or whether it goes directly onto the central banks. So for any financial um, intermediation system, any banking activities, liquidity of course is key. And liquidity really means the ability to shift or convert assets on demand without loss. And that's of course particularly relevant when we're talking about asset-backed financing rather than bank-based financing. We want to shift or convert the assets into a safer one. If in doubt, you want to have cash and of all the cash um, instruments, if in doubt, you want to have dollar in the midst of the crisis, which is why we experienced dollar scarcity in 2008 and are experiencing something close to that or similar um, now as well. So in order to uh, sort of create some kind of a buffer against the risk of not being able to convert at the price you want to convert, we're of course using over collateralization very often for the lender that works as long as the buffer is calculated accurately and the assets don't lose more value for the borrower. Um, of course, this creates additional liquidity risk and um, the borrower might not always be equipped to um, deal with that as we have um, um, seen in, in the 2008 crisis already. Um, in principle, securitization is meant to diversify risk. Uh, in fact, I think the tranching that's what, that was introduced into securitization meant that we're not really just you know, not really diversifying, but we're actually structuring risk. We're cre creating hierarchies of risk because the senior tranches have less risk than the junior tranches and everything in between. So basically allocating risk to different um, investors in the system. Um, um, and then last but not least, sort of the opaqueness of the risk allocation can amplify the search for liquidity in times of crisis because we don't really know where the risk lies and so we're trying to head for the ex ex exit as soon as possible. So the simplified ecology of shadow banking looks something like that. You have some assets on the left and you just feed them into the system by basically transforming relatively illiquid assets into liquid assets. Um, you securitize them, you put them into a securities lending markets using repos. Um, you can stack other um, instruments on top of them, such as CDOs or CLOs. You need certain conduits um, that, that buy them, that feed some of the cash into, into the system and then transfer them ultimately to the um, investors at the end of, of that chain. Um, again, as I said before, all of these um, um, assets and intermediaries can be um, exchanged and have been exchanged. So when we look at back to mortgage securitization, we find um, homes, sort of houses and land that, that they were built on as sort of the key asset. We're looking at the liquidity transformation through the securitization. Um, money market funds were critical in funneling the cash into the system, pension funds as well, the government sponsored entities, which used to do some of the uh, securitization at the beginning, um, but increasingly became entities that funneled cash into, into the system. And then ultimately, of course, the end investors that provide the cash. Now, um, when we look uh, again a little closer, um, and, and we also we find, of course, that behind the shadow banking system that made the market securitization and this chain of intermediation possible, there were still our good old banks, right? And um, the banks provided important uh, liquidity support um, in part through line, lines of credit um, um, that were uh, backing some of the products, the um, asset-backed securities, the mortgage-backed securities. And of course, um, there were also the key sponsors of money market funds. So in the end, the banks were really on the hook and we saw this, what this meant in the crisis. And of course, we also realized that the banks alone are not on the hook, but ultimately the banks are backed by the central banks and that's sort of the backstopping mechanism for the entire system. So a system that was built basically um, to create an alternative or a parallel banking system was ultimately free riding on key features of the banking system, the liquidity provisioning by banks. And banks, of course, are structured and have been regulated to provide important liquidity backstopping when they run out, ultimately, it's the central banks that provide that liquidity backstopping. Now, after the global crisis, uh, we've seen actually a, a major borrowing spree in the corporate sector, which you can just look at at this graph. Of course, it started much earlier. You can trace this back into the early 1980s or even 1970s, but you see the kink also after 2008, corporate borrowing really has gone up quite a bit. 
Um, uh, what I'm basically suggesting here that we've seen that the shadow banking practices that they have migrated to incorporate the balance sheets of non-financial corporations. So we basically have the asset classes that we're using now to feed into the system are of course um, corporate shares, corporate bonds. In particular, we have again conduits that um, transform them. These are in part money market funds, but pension funds and others are key here. We're using similar um, uh, financing, structured finance techniques. Um, many of the securities, the bonds, etc., are either you know exchange traded funds. We're reading a lot about them, especially those that were created for uh, bonds rather than shares the, these days. Um, we know that many of them also are, are being repoed um, um, further in the market in securities lending exchanges. Um, we have CLOs uh, um, stacked on top of them, and ultimately we go back to the cash um, investors here as well. Um, what we've seen, and this was kind of interesting recently, of course, that the central bank, the Fed even stepped in and bought corporate bonds. And many people have been wondering why the Fed would buy corporate bonds. And I guess this was, in my reading, it's an early intervention to um, make sure that intermediaries that hold bonds and can't sell them in the market and might um, try therefore and have actually tried in March, as we saw, to um, sell other assets, including treasury bills and even gold, which are the safest assets you would think people hold on to. But if they can't sell bonds, then they will sell other assets. So here, I think the central bank went in to um, make it possible for these investors to get rid of the bonds that were losing in, in value. So we have the central bank on board again in the system as well. Um, one, was, one other thing I come back to the scheme um, in, in a second. One other thing I just want to point out is when you look um, inside the bond markets as it has evolved over time, um, particular since the 2008 crisis, you actually find something that we've seen also with asset-backed securities, the mortgage-backed securities, namely that the risk taking within each group, like the investment grade group, and the non-investment grade group, but I'm focusing on, in particular on the investment grade group, that the risk taken within this group has increased. So if you look into the left-hand chart, you see that the triple B rated assets are over 50% um, of all the, um, the corporate bonds in the investment grade, and triple A has gone down um, uh, to almost zero, um, and, and um, A is, is, is um, close to triple B, not quite um, there. So you, so you see basically that the quality of assets that are being um, um, fed into the investment grade securities is declining. That of course um, signif signifies um, an increasing demand for assets that can be fed into the system. And what happens typically and has happened before is that the quality of assets that are being fed into the system declines over time. Um, something um, um, that we can also observe in the CLO market, which is a, another market segment, a much smaller market segment, but nonetheless, that sort of signifies the stress that builds into the system, is that, of course, something like um, a major shock, such as the coronavirus, exposes this market to a big crisis. You can see that about 50% of the CLO market currently is in, 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 in crisis. Okay, once we look at the entire market in crisis mode again, and I think the beauty of crisis, as I suggested in the book, um, I co-authored with Curtis Milhaupt in 2008 about um, uh, uh, corporate governance, but we use the crisis always as, the, as an entry point to look at how systems really function because once you have a crisis, you can dissect the different institutional mechanisms that really work here. Once you look basically at the, um, at the current crisis and the structure of financing firms um, using more shadow banking techniques rather than direct banking, sort of market-based lending, not only, only market-based um, equity um, financing, you see, as I said, suggested before, the central bank um, intervened. And then behind the CLOs, and I just showed you that the CLO market is really stressed, most of the holders of CLOs are banks, insurance companies, and asset managers. So again, we have intermediaries that hold them. Uh, the banks can do some of the backstopping, and they have a pretty good equity cushion, in part because of the major regulatory reforms that were done um, in, in, in after 2008 with Dodd-Frank, et cetera. Um, you might have seen the Financial Times today where um, the governor of the Minnesota Fed, I think, said that the banks should go out and raise another 200 billion of capital in order to be able to sustain um, the crash. So they have liquidity buffers that you can uh, mobilize insurance companies to some extent. 
others are less um, well equipped to do so. Here's just a chart that um, is from the Financial Stability Board, just to give a sense of the size of the shadow banking relative to ordinary banks. The ordinary banks are in dark blue. Um, then the other shades are the shadow banks, basically. Um, um, and you have the central bank, the light blue, um, backstopping that system. So according to some measures, at least since 2018 um, and after, we have um, a system that relies more heavily on shadow banking techniques than it does on banking, um, in part, of course, in response also to the, um, uh, to, to the regulatory reforms that were introduced. So what, what, what does this tell us um, and, and how should we think about this and what does it tell us about corporate governance? How should we think about the organization of financial market in, that, in this regard? Um, so I start again from a, from a structural perspective and I would argue here that um, uh, the key thing that we have to understand is that liquidity is not ubiquitous, but liquidity is deeply hierarchically structured. The only truly liquid asset is legal tender and only the cash that some, not even all sovereigns issue. Uh, Perry Merling put this very nicely in 2008. He's basically said, forget the G G7, watch the C5, the C5 being the um, key central banks. They issue an asset that they can actually issue in, in, in um, unlimited quantity at critical points in times. So no other entity can do that. Why is that so? Well, private entities by definition um, cannot uh, manipulate their own survival constraint to use Minsky's term where they have a hard budget constraint uh, to use uh, Kornai's um, terminology. If they had a soft budget constraint, we would call them socialist and the softer um, or more elastic their budget constraint is, the closer they come to a socialized um, type of system. But given this, given that private entities in principle are bound by their own ability to manage, manage their assets and liabilities, they have only limited resources to step in and provide the necessary liquidity if there's stress in the market. So ultimately you always go back up up towards the central bank and ideally to a central bank that has really complete control over its own survival constraint. Um, typically those central banks of countries that issue their own currency, that's key, and that issue their own debt under in their own currency and under their own laws. These are truly monetarily sovereign, others are not. Which is why we of course then have um, swap lines to different central banks and as you saw again in this crisis the expansion of swap lines um, to the Fed from central banks around the globe ultimately at the discretion of the Fed so it's not an equal playing field here. So not all sovereigns are equal not all private entities are equal we are living in a hierarchical world in a hierarchical world that is structured to be rather um, uh, um, volatile I'll come back to that point in a second. So what are the implications for corporate governance? Um, I, my reading of what has happened over the last um, two decades, but accelerated maybe since the financial crisis, is that corporations have become, so non-financial corporations have become um, capital mints. I make a similar point about financial corporations uh, using the Lehman Brothers case um, in my book. Um, where basically we're using the corporate form and structures of the corporation where we can have multiple subsidiaries with um, debt relations vis-a-vis -vis outside creditors, then very often backstopped, guaranteed by the parent company, the parent company being the central um, um, profit hub selling and, and then channeling the money back to its shareholders. That's the kind of structure we've seen not only in Lehman, we've seen this in, uh, increasingly in other major corporations, including companies that went under, such as Toy R Us. Um, or Eastern Kodak um, and the like. Um, so, um, uh, so what corporations really are about, they're about creating and returning, um, uh, creating financial returns for their shareholders and to their creditors as well. Um, what exactly they do and how they do this is in, in fact secondary to the ability to financialize their balance sheet. Um, and I think the symptoms that speak to this kind of diagnosis is that we have seen um, once the rise of asset managers as both shareholders and creditors, of course, through different funds very often, but they're really important institutional investors here. There is an increasing imbalance between debt finance and firm investments, which we have observed since the early 1990s at the latest. Some have spoken in, in recent years about secular stagnation, which might be very much related to the financial structure that we have. 
We have seen, of course, the rise of share repurchases and dividend payments. Um, some have labeled this like disgorge the cash. Um, you could interpret this also as uh, um, a way in which firms, non-financial firms, are basically assuming part of the liquidity risks of this shadow banking system as I described it. Um, and then I would even go as far as saying that the business roundtable statement last September about stakeholder capitalism might be interpreted as a kind of a self-defense of a system in which the CEOs, even of the largest corporations, increasingly realize that this system may not be sustainable even for them. So the bigger picture here is that shadow banking is inherently vol um, volatile. All banking is volatile. Shadow banking too is volatile. The problem is it has no built-in liquidity buffers as the banks um, were structured and regulated increasingly since the mid-19th mid century. Um, this has not happened yet to the shadow banking system. We might see this in response to the COVID um, crisis. Um, uh, so both the asset providers and the intermediaries in this system face um, great volatility when, and you don't need a big shock like this one. I think some of the um, frictions in the system became apparent already before the crisis. So the COVID crisis really just exposes weaknesses in a deeper structure of the system. Um, looking beyond COVID-19, um, I would argue that um, we are probably seeing a, a heightened um, volatility in our environment, like just even outside financial markets, climate change, we might see more pandemics. So as um, volatility increases around us, we're dealing with a financial system that is structured to be um, um, very volatile. And that's probably a pairing that doesn't um, work well um, um, together. Um, Sheila Bear recently tweeted, um, once we get past this, let's get off the financial financialization carousel. Um, I think given the future that we face that we know is increasingly volatile. So it's not just you know, fundamental uncertainty where we know that for certain we have a lot of uncertainty. Um, we probably need to think about restructuring the financial system and that includes, that includes um, um, the way the corporate sector is financing, financing itself. Let me just sort of um, give you some of the sources that I'm using here. Of course, Minsky, Merling, uh, several papers by his, also Carolyn Sisako, um, who's written a very interesting work on the structure of um, uh, debt finance um, and a couple of blocks in the Just Money block more recently. So let me stop here. I saw it's sort of kind of, I'm not sure where we have questions. I mean, I, I hand it over to you, Jeff, to see whether any any things that we, with, with enough minutes left to talk about questions. I've sometimes went on. Yeah, uh, Katerina, I, I think what we're doing is we're saving the Q&A for the end. I think what's gonna happen, we've gotten a bunch of them and then we're gonna refer them to uh, the panelists for uh, uh, sort of specific responses and maybe we'll collect them in some, some place, but um, we're a little time constrained and so, um, uh, we're now going to pass the baton to um, to Josh. Great. Okay, take it over, Josh. Thank you. Okay, let's see if I can get this up. Okay. Uh, great. Well, it's great to be with everyone. I think this is a uh, just a, a brilliant idea and uh, uh, very exciting that we can have events like these uh, virtually. So I'm going to talk about short selling and short selling disclosure in a pandemic. And uh, I'm basically going to hit three points. The first is I'm going to talk about some recent developments uh, in the regulatory area concerning uh, short selling, both prior to and following the COVID crisis. Uh, in this respect, I think picking up uh, on, on uh, the spirit of, of some of what Katarina was uh, pointing out, that uh, some of these trends uh, are uh, pre-existing the crisis and the pandemic and were exacerbated by it. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some uh, of my empirical work on uh, manipulative short campaigns and uh, probably spend most of the time on uh, recent efforts to deter manipulative short selling and talk about uh, the new rulemaking petition on uh, short and distort uh, submitted to the SEC in February. Uh, prior to COVID-19, there was, I think, in recent months, it's fair to say, a growing uh, skepticism of short selling. Um, there was a Reuters piece in uh, November, which was titled Return of Short Selling Bans, uh, Market Protection, or a War Against Truth. Uh, and this uh, uh, expose talked uh, about uh, uh, yeah, a, a growing 
uh, 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 if you will, trend of restricting short selling. Um, one place in particular that this was uh, uh, acutely felt or that made the headlines was Japan's uh, GPIF, the largest uh, pension fund in the world, announcing on December 4th that it would not lend shares on its global equities portfolio. The rationale being that as a steward uh, of this capital, it had a responsibility to fulfill its stewardship uh, obligations and not participate effectively in short selling. Uh, as a, the phrase that GPF used was as a super long-term investor and a universal owner, uh, GPF had an obligation to prevent activities that hindered the long-term growth of its investee companies. And this is interesting uh, in light of the fact that securities lending has become a uh, rather large source of non-investment revenue, particularly for passive investors, uh, which uh, is, is something that uh, I'm working on uh, at the moment. Uh, since COVID-19, we saw uh, a kind of snap uh, uh, into place of several short selling bans. So uh, immediately in the, at the height of the volatility in mid-March, we saw uh, Belgium and Austria. They were later followed uh, by France, Greece, and Spain. Uh, just, uh, I guess it would be today at 12 uh, 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 BST, British Standard Time, uh, this uh, short selling ban was extended for another month. So, uh, you know, this, this happened, if you think back to 2008, this happens uh, in financial crises. We see regulators stepping in and banning short sales entirely. Uh, I think it's interesting that these bans are coming on the wake of a trend of, uh, of, 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 glowing, uh, of growing global skepticism uh, uh, of short selling. And part of what I'd like to do in this presentation is think about uh, what this means, whether this is a good idea, what's driving this, and what uh, we might do from a policy standpoint to address some of the concerns that are, uh, that are being raised. I think one of the first points to start with is that uh, short selling has long been established as very important and beneficial for financial markets, but there's been a growing trend of research on what's called activist short selling, which is kind of the current uh, uh, version of short selling that is in the headlines. Um, Slava Foss and uh, Ian Apple have a paper which uh, describes this phenomenon, and you know it's distinguished from uh, traditional kind of classical short selling in that we're not just talking about taking a position, a short position, but we're talking about advancing campaigns. Uh, and uh, this has been called a kind of short activism uh, because it bears a lot of similarities to traditional shareholder activism, except uh, it's uh, on the short side. So uh, Ian and Slava in this paper uh, document uh, generally that this has been increasing uh, and talk a little bit about what sorts of campaigns are driving uh, price reactions. Uh, Frank Partnoy has a paper with Peter Mulk and Barbara Bliss in which uh, they categorize this sort of activism. And uh, there's been other research on what kinds of firms are targeted by activist short sellers. Um, my work on short and distort and it picks up on this trend and asks what kind of activist short selling should, be worried, should we be worried about? And uh, I look at Seeking Alpha in an empirical paper, uh, which I'll just summarize here. Uh, basically, what we find on Seeking Alpha is that there is uh, a, a, a substantial body of short attacks which are published by anonymous contributors. And these short attacks uh, uh, by anonymous contributors are generally protected constitutionally, in the United States at least, due to uh, the constitu unique constitutional protections for anonymity. Um, but this sort of uh, and non, uh, anonymity leads to interesting implications from a reputational standpoint. We see, for example, uh, that uh, on Seeking Alpha, the use of pseudonyms or anonymous identities seems to undermine the kinds of reputational sanctions that would deter manipulation or abuse. So if you're going out and putting a message out there that's, uh, that's, that's false, if you're doing that under your own name, you're uh, much more likely to be held accountable by the market than if you're able to recycle pseudonyms. Uh, and what I find in this paper is that there is in fact a, uh, a rather substantial phenomenon of uh, putting false information out there under a, a pseudonymous anonymous identity uh, and switching that identity uh, in, uh, in rinsing and repeating, if you will. Uh, the paper documents uh, essentially a V-shaped pattern for some of these attacks, not all of these attacks, which leads to, on average, a kind of hockey stick phenomenon where we see that there are, in fact, 
exploitations of uh, pseudonymity, exploitations of uh, this uh, ability to reset your identity in order to uh, successfully execute short attacks. One of the things that's interesting that I find in the paper is that a lot of these attacks seem to be driven by V-shaped options trading. What I mean by V-shaped options trading is that immediately prior to the attack, uh, we observe a spike in put options followed by a spike in call options uh, right after the attack. Uh, this seems to hold across a variety of measures, uh, and we see other deleterious effects on market liquidity. Uh, all in all, in the period that I study in this paper, uh, there's uh, over 20 billion of mispricing if we measure mispricing as uh, prices that are in effect uh, uh, undergoing this sort of V within uh, five trading days. Again, the data seem to suggest that uh, reputation is the mechanism by which this sort of manipulative short selling is affecting markets. Um, this has led to uh, uh, myself, uh, Professor Coffey, who presented earlier, and a number of our colleagues here in the United States to think together about what kinds of uh, rulemaking efforts the SEC might make to uh, deter manipulative short campaigns. And partly inspired not only by the empirical data, but also by some very high profile short attacks towards the end of last year, including the attack on uh, General Electric by Harry Markopoulos, which subsequently reversed uh, in its entirety. Uh, what we are advocating in this rulemaking petition, I think can serve, uh, I hope in any event, as a guide to European and other regulators who might be thinking about the best way to regulate this sort of uh, uh, manipulative short selling. I think the key thing to, uh, to keep in mind is that it's possible to deter manipulative short selling while encouraging short selling more generally. And I think that's really the balance that we try to strike with this proposal. And I'm gonna talk now about the ingredients of the proposal and how it addresses uh, these concerns. So we start by, uh, by, by making it clear that the case that we're concerned about uh, with, with uh, manipulative short selling is uh, inducing a panic that a short seller can profit off of in the very, very short term uh, without regard to the long-term price implications of uh, this sort of, uh, uh, of inducing a run on the stock. And uh, we reiterate in this proposal that while short selling does serve a critical function in the capital markets, uh, some short sellers are in effect closing their positions uh, very rapidly, so rapidly, that it's not clear that this sort of short selling in fact promotes price accuracy and the sort of liquidity benefits that have been well established in the literature. Uh, and I think it's important at this juncture to remember that the empirical studies which have found that uh, restraints on restrictions in short selling are negative for markets have done so by looking at broad based restrictions. So we have, uh, we have studies that looked at the SEC's restriction in 2008 and other settings where uh, short selling as a whole has been restricted, and there have been a number of negative effects to market liquidity as a result. But we think that's very different from thinking about very short-lived campaigns, campaigns which are likely to be much more uh, manipulative or dangerous, if you will, uh, to ordinary investors. So our proposal consists of two rules that we are petitioning the SEC uh, to enact. The first is to impose a duty to update voluntarily disclosed short positions. Now, as many of you know, in the United States, under the federal securities laws, short sellers are not required to affirmatively disclose their short positions. And our proposal is consistent with that. So unlike Europe, we are not advocating, you know, we are not advocating uh, for the mandatory disclosure of short positions like we see in Europe, for example. Rather, uh, our argument is that many short sellers, particularly short activists, voluntarily disclose their short position in order to give credibility to their reports. Uh, our argument, our request to the SEC, is that short sellers be required to update a voluntary disclosure of this kind when it no longer reflects current holdings or trading intention. Otherwise, the market would continue to rely on an outdated and incorrect statement. In effect, what we have in mind is a short seller who goes out and says, I am short this company, induces the panic and a run on the stock, but is in effect closing their position by buying into the selling wave that's been created by the statement, I am short. We think that it would be uh, very beneficial from the standpoint of reducing price overreactions and by alerting the market for the market to know that the short seller is in fact changed their trading strategy, that they are now closing the position uh, because that 
uh, will inform investors who might be otherwise selling their shares that they could be potentially transacting against the very short seller whose recommendation they were following. Uh, that is, they could be providing such a short seller with an exit uh, to their position. We think these sorts of disclosures need to be specific and clear and uh, not uh, contain boilerplate that uh, doesn't really give investors specific notice as to the trading strategy involved. The second rule that we're proposing is disclosure of intent ex ante regarding rapid short positions. We think that short sellers which publish reports uh, with the ex ante intent to close their short positions quickly thereafter should be required to disclose their intent to do so. Uh, and what we have in mind are cases where a short seller might, for example, have put in a buy limit order five or 10% below the current price of the stock uh, and, and thereby in effect engineered an exit on the panic alone. So if the short seller says, you know, this company is 50% or 60% overvalued and they have in place uh, a five or 10% uh, 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 you know, buy limit order five or 10% below the current price, you know, we think that's the sort of thing that uh, is, is actually misleading. And uh, our view in this regard is informed by the case law on scalping, it's called here in the United States, which has been well established on the long side. If uh, uh, someone touts a stock, if they promote a stock without disclosing that they have a sell order uh, at five or 10% above the current market price, uh, that is a, has been found by the courts to be a, a violation of uh, the anti-fraud provisions of the securities laws here in the United States. Traditionally, this was uh, uh, the, uh, on the long side. There haven't been scalping cases brought on the short side, and we think that's a very narrowly tailored way to deter the sort of short selling, uh, a manipulative short selling that we might be concerned about. That is to say, short sellers have, must have, uh, have a duty to disclose if in fact they are closing out their position five or 10% below the current market price. Again, not because we have any problem with them doing that, but because we think it's misleading to say that a company is 50 or 60% overvalued uh, when you're actually uh, uh, ex ante closing out that position uh, within uh, a five or 10% drop. Last thing I'm going to talk about is the final component of our proposal, which is a safe harbor. So we recognize that we don't want to be chilling legitimate criticism of public companies. We, again, don't want our rule to go so far as to chill short selling more generally. Uh, for that reason, we propose a safe harbor. The safe harbor would basically provide that short sellers would not be subject to scalping liability when they close a position at a price equal to or lower than a target stated or implied in a report. Uh, so for example, if a short seller were to say this company is overvalued by 20% and they were to close their position at or below 20%, a 20%, 25%, 30% decline, et cetera, uh, that would in, uh, entitle them to a safe harbor which would protect them against scalping liability. We think this would give tremendous certainty to short sellers that they could in fact uh, go out there with a campaign where they're convinced the stock is overvalued, make their case, put a price target out there, and all they have to do is trade consistently with what they're telling the rest of the market. We think what this is likely to do is to reduce overreaction and enhance price accuracy uh, more generally. So we think this is a, a modest proposal that uh, is, is more narrowly tailored to the problem of manipulative short selling than the broad-based prohibitions that are currently uh, either being contemplated or that have been, in fact, put in place in Europe. And with that, I'll hand it over. Thank you much, Josh. Uh, okay, so I am, I am um, the final Columbia participant. And uh, let's see. Okay, is that is that on the uh, the screen? I I hope. Yes. Um, it is. Yeah. Great. Uh, so um, the the talk I want to close with is share share shareholder value, systematic stewardship, and uh, the missing government. Um, which is an effort to pull together some current lines of research with uh, the pandemic. So um, the pandemic for me was, um, has been shocking for many reasons. I live in New York, but it, 
revealed a uh, disturbing shortfall in governmental capacity. As, as an internal report said, uh, this was the whitest of white swans. Um, a pandemic was predicted. There had been prior examples of, of, of viruses that had the potential, but just didn't put it all together of being sufficiently infectious, sufficiently serious. And uh, the COVID-19 circumstance does. Uh, so, so and, and this was at earlier stages, this was foreseen and gained and et cetera. And yet the poor planning, uh, the operational failures, certainly in the United States have been extremely dismaying. Um, and yet in a certain way, we're not surprised because after all, we've seen governments and, you know, including the U.S., especially the U.S., uh, fail to anticipate climate change risk, which is accelerating. So the question that links that, that the observation with the theme of this event is uh, the core, core governance element. It, are, are we part of this? Is the work we do tied, tied, tied up with the governmental failure that we've that we're now observing, the cost of which we're now experiencing, does the way the governance has been structured um, produce a focus on the, the valuation creation for the firms only, for the shareholders only? Have we, because of this focus, neglected the public goods creation and the diminishment of government capacity? So that's the concern. And kind of what motivates this is a correlation in time. The shareholder value concern is increased at the same time that um, there's been a decline in the capacity of governments. And, and obviously, you know, to make the causal claim is, is, um, would be rather bold, but the correlation is, is what makes me uneasy. And, and part of it, is really when you go back and look at uh, the Friedman account of what the focus on shareholder value ought to be, um, business is supposed to use its resources for gain so long as it stays within the rules of the game. And so one way to frame the concern is that management's pursuit of shareholder value have uh, that, that that's extended beyond the rules of the game to an effort dramatically to change the rules. So business elites have always had uh, a disproportionate political influence. And the concern is that um, uh, that, that influence has been directed in, in specific ways that um, uh, reduce the capacity of governments to respond as government should respond. And that the short term misbehavior that is most concerning is less firm specific investment in R&D, but the way firms have been engaged in, in, in politics in a way that diminished the collective capacity to respond to an event such as the one before us. So you might say, all right, so I've got a US focus here. Um, how could the shareholder value uh, governance concerns play a role in this when the governmental failure was widespread it occurred in many places that don't have U.S. conception of, 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 of a regular shareholder value pursuit and ownership patterns are different. So, so one notion is um, whether U.S. ideas of share, shareholder value as the, the goal, including the thin theories of public goods creation, may have a global influence. And so one way to think about that is to look at the multinationals, which are large firms. Um, uh, their market cap is about 20% of the market cap of, of all firms, but they're especially influential firms because they in effect unite the globe. Their, their supply chains link together the globe. A lot of trade occurs within uh, 
the multinational firms. And when we think about law, we think not only about um, uh, the liability rules that determine fiduciary duties on the part of directors and officers, but we also think of the, about the soft law of norms and expectations. And so do we have global governance for large firms in that sense? And as I say, I think you might look to the governing law of the multinationals and the GSIBs as firms which are not only large, but influential as uh, for insight in that regard. So um, uh, when you do a list of, of this is, um, this is uh, the unctate list of multinationals and um, the G, the G, the G SIBs. When you look at the domicile, what, what you see is Delaware plus the UK, and the UK I think has similarly a shareholder focus. That's 43% on a market cap basis of these very influential uh, firms. So, so there is, in, in effect, in the world, um, uh, a very large shareholder focus that may affect not only how firms are run, but how firms attempt to engage with governments, and therefore what kinds of capacities the governments themselves will have. So um, now, the pursuit of, of stakeholder value has been offered up as an alternative object objective for the firm. I'm um, a skeptic as to what the operational guidance might come from stakeholderism. Um, but my thought is, is that requiring the directors to, to, to consider those elements, even if they're always going to come out in favor of the shareholders, because the shareholders vote after all, nevertheless, this, a group, this, this, this elite group may be, become aware in a, a deeper way about the necessary role of government and the public goods goods creation. So consider a merger that results in downsizing and layoffs. If the directors go through a systematic reflection on the impact of, for example, employees, the conclusion I don't think will be let's not do the merger, but it may be that the directors gain appreciation for the fact that there's a missing piece, that there needs to be some agency i.e. the government, which takes care of, of, um, of uh, the focus on human uh, potential over a lifetime. And there are many other similar examples, time, time is constraining. And so the stakeholderism claim becomes sensitization for business elites. It's an effort to re-socialize them politically potent actors on the necessity of the public good. And, and the creation of those goods is part of long-term sh shareholder value creation as part of sustainability. Now there is an alternative route to this broader perspective and that is systematic stewardship, what I call systematic stewardship. And it focuses on this that the product that the asset managers are creating, diversified stock port portfolios, suggest that we should reframe stewardship away from firm-specific concerns to systematic concerns with the aim of achieving the highest risk-adjusted returns for the beneficiaries. And this is not a matter of socially responsible investing, but cold, hard finance. It leads to a view that the creation of government capacity in, on many dimensions is a way to reduce systematic risk. So, so here's, here's the insight. We need to reframe stewardship in light of modern portfolio theory, which teaches us that, that full diversification eliminates idiosyncratic risk such that the only risk that remains is systematic risk, the risk that cannot be eliminated through diversification. 
investors focus on two elements, expected returns and risk, but they want to maximize risk adjusted returns. Now, the point is systematic stewardship deals with the reduction of systematic risk. Firm specific stewardship is gonna be idiosyncratic. It, it rarely, I, I mean, you need a theory as to why idiosyncratic stewardship, firm specific stewardship is gonna improve the performance of the portfolio as a whole, which means that the reframing requires these asset managers to think in terms of how do they reduce systematic risk and thereby improve the welfare of their beneficiaries. So again, a, a full account would develop the systematic, pardon, would develop the stewardship case for financial stability measures uh, and, and, lead, and lead us to understand why a diversified investor really ought to care about the control of risk taking by banks and others. Um, there would also be a strong stewardship case for measures, firm specific measures to mitigate the climate change risk. This is the point. These measures are commonly framed as a trade-off between lower expecting, expected returns and protecting the environment. The key point is, is that investors want to maximize risk-adjusted returns and the failure to attend to the climate change risk is hugely it's systematic and that they want to minimize as well. There's a stewardship case as well for firm specific measures to mitigate social stability risk. Um, and you know, that can be developed, the time constraints here. Here is where I think um, you know, it's, it gets tougher, direct public policy engagement in a broad way to reduce systematic risk. And um, that I sell, and, and, and that, as I'm kind of working on a book on these issues requires a lot more thought by me, I think. But the point I want to make, and this is kind of the close a little bit, is, is the systematic stewardship model is a move away from a trade-off model, accepting lower returns in exchange for uh, the, the climate producing activities of firms or social stability producing values. Um, we need to accept the fact that there are certain risks that are systematic and, and they're systematic whether or not we accept the fact of it. Moving towards a risk adjusted thinking about these things um, uh, enables uh, uh, asset managers to think in a broader way. The final point I will make in a, a minute is that one there are different ways to get at this. And, and I think direct actions by the asset managers probably is not the way to go because it leaves them politically exposed, but it does become a way to empower the activists, the climate change folks who maybe want to push firms to behave in particular ways. And it becomes a way to empower managements who may want to act in ways that attend to the systematic concerns, the long-term concerns, precisely because the asset managers can say, we will support managers who are pursuing those strategies against the, against the potential claims of the activists who might object. Um, the, fi the final point I wanna make is that I don't think this raises the, tr the traditional concerns with the common ownership critique uh, precisely because um, uh, a systematically stewardship motivated action um, doesn't create any trust harm. It improves um, the welfare of, 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 of consumers by avoiding the possibility of um, negative economic shocks, which would make them considerably less well off. So, um, uh, again, the goal is to refocus attention away from single firm stewardship towards systematic stewardship. The goal is to think less about what firms specifically ought to be doing um, 
to maximize on the own firm basis without a consideration, a necessary consideration of, of for the, the long term of what governments are able to do, the capacity of governments, and to understand that the capacity of governments is not at war with, uh, with even a shareholder value perspective. Okay, so this brings us to the end of the um, Columbia portion of the panel. And um, there are lots of questions that have arisen to uh, what some of we panelists have said. Um, there's not really gonna be time, I think, to address them and some of the relevant panelists have had to go off and teach, I think. What I would suggest is uh, um, uh, all of the panelists are available through the Columbia website. The email addresses are there. And certainly speaking for myself and I think for others, we would much appreciate to hear uh, your, your, your reactions and feedback and pushback. Uh, so with that, I think I will turn the uh, the program over to 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 Elaine, um, and we will take a pause till I think um, the next one is is Harvard, if I recall. But um, see 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 everyone uh, soon. <laughs>